Hello, everyone, and welcome to class six, narrative structure and architecture in level design. So this week, we are going to be, um, you'll have read Pattern Language for Game Design, Chapter 14, Understanding Techniques, if you wanted to get a head start on the exercise you'll be doing in class today. And uh, you should have read An Architectural Approach to Level Design, Chapter 6, Building, um, building uh, Exciting Levels with Dangerous Architecture. And then also uh, have read a pattern from a pattern language and uh, described how that applies to games. Uh, lecture topics this week, we're going to be talking about tropes versus patterns. Uh, I know a couple of people had asked about that in their writings early on. Uh, we'll talking about uh, we'll be talking about narrative, particularly the three act structure and how that's sort of a fractal concept, and then um, intention versus or and improvisation or versus improvisation, composition and execution, um, intended, trained and chaotic behaviors in players, and then uh, a little bit about basic mechanics and patterns in one of the challenge exercises. So a lot of lecture topics, um, class activities. We'll review the emotional designs from last week, and we'll be doing an exercise on narrative structures. We'll be doing a uh, pattern for understanding techniques. And then there are two challenge exercises, which I'll talk to you about at the end of the lecture. Um, also, your project this week will be to design um, a scene using the elements that you select in exercise 15 um, so that you've come to understand using exercise 15, hopefully. All right, so tropes versus patterns. Um, what is a trope? So a trope is a repeated uh, motif that we see in different kinds of media um, that compresses and conveys uh, a significant set of knowledge because it's something that we're all familiar with. Um, that sounds a lot like a pattern. So how is, how is that different than a pattern? Um, tropes have a social context that go along with them. Uh, they're not something that someone developed uh, or that there was sort of analysis that uh, distilled the mechanic and purpose of something. They're uh, a repeated thing that has happened over and over again within a particular cultural context. And so they're shaped by that cultural context. Um, so what, what do I mean exactly by that? Um, example of a trope would be something like, Lone Warrior takes on the forces of hell. Um, you know, you might see that in Doom or um, you might see that in, you know, the um, the Orpheus myth. You might see that in, um, you know, a movie of Evil Dead, right? Uh, so this is a theme that we see across different kinds of media. Um, and uh, but it carries this whole cultural context, right? Lone Warrior, like one man must face the forces of hell. Usually it's a man um, in that case, you know, hell implies that there is a, you know, evil afterlife or alternate dimension. Um, you know, so there's all of this, like it, it implies now there's, there's evil in the world, there's supernatural evil um, that, you know, you can fix this, um, that you're the last stand. So there's there's all of this cultural context, even though like that's a pretty benign uh, trope as they go, uh, it still has has all of this, this background. Um, that trope might be an implementation of different patterns. So something like guilt-free enemies, you know, I'm killing demons, so I don't have to feel bad about them. I'm killing zombies, so I don't have to feel bad at them, about them. Um, might be implemented, I'm killing robots, right? Like that, that particular pattern has a lot of different applications. Um, you know, demons from hell could be one of them. Uh, setting justifies the mechanics could be another one, right? Like if uh, my setting is hell, then only having the ability to kill the bad guys really makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, nobody questions why, you know, the doom guy can't engage in, you know, political negotiation and romance. Well, he's in hell fighting demons. That's, that's what he's up to. That's you know, the setting satisfies this set of mechanics that we have. So those would be examples of, um, of patterns and those patterns might be combined or, or implemented using the trope. Um, but the trope has all this baggage. The patterns hopefully have been thought through and exist to solve a problem 
um, intentionally as opposed to unintentionally sort of bringing with them all of the, um, the background um, concepts that go along with them. So tropes do seem kind of useful uh, in that they, they convey all of that background, right? Like if you want to imply a Judeo-Christian background, if you want to imply you know, a patriarchal society or whatever, then, you know, those things becoming and being compressed into this trope of a lone warrior um, would make sense. But um, the tropes are also like stereotypes. They're things that sure they convey a lot of information and they compress a lot of uh, accumulated cultural knowledge, but that knowledge isn't always true. Um, and, and often it's hurtful uh, and, uh, you know, racist or sexist or classist right all of those ideas are the kind of things get that get wrapped up in tropes um, so tropes are related to stereotypes that's a problem they're kind of what you get if you combine stereotypes and patterns you get tropes um, and so you may not always be wanting to do that kind of thing um, so you know any, any other examples of um of tropes that you see are things like the princess in the, uh, is in another castle, right? The damsel in distress trope. So we see that throughout games and, you know, it's used as a great motivator, uh, you know, hey, hey guys playing this game, like, don't you want to rescue the girl? Um, okay, but it's not just guys playing the game and not just guys want to rescue girls and girls don't need to be rescued. And like, why are we perpetuating all of these ideas in our game? Um, is that is that really what we wanted to convey, or did we really just want to motivate people to play the level? And if what we were trying to do wasn't, you know, reinforce gender stereotypes, but was motivate people to play the level, then maybe a different implementation of the pattern would have been more effective. Um, so that's important. So uh, you need to um, look at all the different impl uh, implementations that you create to resolve the problems you have in a pattern and see if those implementations are tropes, right? If you are recapitulating ideas, and if so, are you aware of what the underlying meaning behind those ideas, uh, those tropes are? Um, you can read about them, right? You can be like, hmm, this seems like a trope, I've seen it around, go to TV tropes or, or you know, do a Google search, read about what that trope means. Um, you know, uh, watch Anita Sarkeesian series Tropes versus uh, Video Games and uh, Women in Video Games. Um, that covers a lot of bad ones uh, that we see throughout games. And it can be kind of painful to watch and it can get your hackles up if you're a guy and you're like, but I love those games. But it's also really well researched and pretty true. So, you know, whether, whether or not you can agree with everything she says, it's worth uh, probably watching that, uh, that series of videos. Um, and being aware of, of the kind of tropes that we have in games and, and what uh, at least some portion of the people who are experiencing them will understand them to, to be and mean. And do you want to be seen? Do you want to be conveying those um, ideas or be seen to be conveying those ideas? So definitely stuff to be aware, uh, aware of. Um, using patterns to understand tropes. Uh, this is a link to uh, to an uh, article that works through that exercise. It's also found in the in the book under the appropriate section. Um, and we'll look at the a pattern which will help you explore them uh, at the end of class. So moving on to the three act structure, total topic change. Um, so three act structure, you've had it drummed into your brain since you know you were in grade school, uh, since you started consuming media in, in the form of books or TV or movies or games, um, a lot of games. So uh, you know what is it? You know, the idea of beginning, a middle, and end. You introduce a problem, you bring that problem to a climax, and then you have a resolution where you resolve um, you know the the falling action. Um, you know, if even in terms of the way that you're trained to write essays, you have an introduction, there's a body and there's a conclusion, uh, beginning, middle, end. So it's, it's everywhere, it's pervasive. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, it's um, sort of inherent to linear time, right? Um, like you can break anything down that way and it's sort of hard to get around it. Um, and it has a lot of, of useful effects. Um, so what does it mean in terms of games? Like, absolutely. You know, games have a beginning, uh, you know, games have an end and there's stuff in between. That must be the middle. So there you go. They fit the three-act structure. Um, yeah, you know, maybe. 
um, games tend to be complicated things. And so do they fit it perfectly in the way that, you know, it, it fits into a lot of other forms of narrative? Uh, games are more of a problem. Um, you know, in your, in your introduction to a game, you are giving the player a reason they want to play the game. You are teaching them or showing them what the basic mechanics of the game are and you're you know, setting them off into the game. In the middle of the game, they're practicing those mechanics and gaining some mastery over them. You know, they're moving through the narrative part uh, you know, in, in the way that they would in any other uh, form of media. And then when they're getting to the, uh, you know, the climax, uh, they're having their skills and abilities tested. Um, they're overcoming, overcoming the final challenges. And then you're, you know, resolving uh, whatever the plot line was and rewarding them for uh, their effort. So it fits into games. Um, how does it map into level design? You know, again, uh, within a single level, you're introducing the concepts that are in the level. You're giving the players a chance to practice them. You're testing them in the boss at the end of the level or, or the increasing challenges throughout the course of the level, you know, over the course of a larger game. You have tutorial levels, introductory levels where you're introducing things. You have a bunch of stuff in the middle. You have you know final bosses at the end of the game, um, and you know closing cinematics. So they fit um, well enough. But you know, in games, um, they're they can be problematic because games can be thirty hours long, and so a simple three act structure doesn't necessarily fit very well into uh, a game. Right? If you have a punchy beginning that hooks you and an exciting conclusion and 30 hours of undifferentiated middle, then, you know, that that's not going to make a very good game. You need something more complex and dynamic than that, which is where you get to what I was saying uh, in the beginning about uh, the three act structure being a fractal fractal construct in terms of games. So your overall game might have a three act structure. Uh, that might, might be broken up into 20 different levels, right? Some of which are introductory, some of which are, are during the middle and lead to a climax, and some of which are, um, you know, resolving things. Um, and within each level, you might have a introductory uh, beginning to the level, you know, the, the middle of that level where they're practicing, and then uh, some conclusion to it. Within a given encounter within a level, you know, you're seeing the monster, realizing you need to fight them. You're, you know, approaching them and engaging the combat um, and beating them. And then you're picking up the reward at the end, whether it's experience or, or gold or their items or whatever it is, or just passage past them um, and moving on. So you have all these different levels of uh, three act structure, you know, uh, seeing an NPC going up to them and talking to them, taking your leave. So this this exists on all different levels in games. Um, and it's useful to think about that and think about what kind of a story you're telling, like what, how are you introducing this encounter? How are you introducing this level? How are you resolving it? Um, not just having those things just sort of thrown in, but thinking about how they, how they fit into that structure. Um, a lot of people have problems with the basic three act structure in, and because it's been done to death, right? Like, oh my gosh, we're so done with this. And that's, that's fine. Well enough, um, you know, don't want to overdo things and want to look for uh, alternatives. Uh, you see people in um, literature trying to undercut the three act structure by having, um, you know, slice of life or, or um, stream of consciousness books. Um, your James Joyce, that kind of thing, Faulkner, where, you know, the, the book is taking place from a um, character's point of view really extremely. It isn't caring about whether or not it, you introduce anything. It just starts right in the middle. You play through the middle and then there's more middle at the end and you finish and you're like, uh, that was that was a thing. Um, they're, they're working to undermine it. You have more complicated structures like you see in a book called House of Leaves by Daniel Lewski. Um, uh, or in uh, movies um, like Memento, where you have this sort of spiral structure where the story is told over and over again in a sort of looping way, giving you more information each time you pass by things um, and unraveling uh, a mystery that way. So you see lots of different uh, types of media creating different structures, and you see that in games too. Um, there'll be an exercise where I want you to think about the ways that we're seeing that kind of subversion in games. Um, so moving on from all of this, uh, those are two articles there that talk about 
problems with the three-act structure. Neither of them is long. Uh, I recommend taking a look at them. Um, you know, I'll ask in class if anybody's read them. So if you want to impress me uh, in class, raise your hand there and have an answer for me. All right, uh, intention versus improvisation. Uh, this is a little bit simpler. So it exists on a number of different levels. Uh, one would be your intent as a developer um, in terms of uh, planning a design, and then uh, as an alternative to that, uh, improvising as a design process. So uh, improvising goes closely along with the idea of iteration, um, except for instead of having a plan and iterating towards your goal, uh, improvisational design is saying, I'm going to implement some little kernel and test it and see if that suggests any new mechanic, right? Um, you know, if you if you don't have a plan for where you're going with your, you know, um, tic tac toe game where you're going to iterate on that and and fix it and make it an interesting complicated game, you just start with that and and change things and iterate and look at where you are each time, what needs to be added to make it more interesting, how do you address balance concerns and just keep exploring from there. Um, you might end up with a very sophisticated design um, without having had a plan of how you're getting there just by by testing. There's a game studio that made a game called um, Crashlands, a uh, mobile uh, game. And uh, they started with their basic initial uh, concept. They claimed to never have had more than one sentence of design document about what they're trying to do at the given moment. Um, you know, think of something, implement it, test it, keep it or, or don't, think of the next thing and add it. Um, and they built a pretty sophisticated, um, you know, survival base building kind of game out of that. Um, that said, it, their, their claim of being entirely improvisational, I think, is a little disingenuous because they were a very experienced group of people who had made a bunch of games together. They were very experienced with the engine they were working in and what it could do. Um, and so they were, there was a lot of implicit design that they just weren't articulating. Um, and they understood each other's design um, styles. And so less design documentation was necessary. I don't necessarily recommend for groups that aren't in that situation trying to design that way. Um, having a plan, especially if you're learning design is very important, but you don't always have to. Um, player intent and planning uh, for actions versus responding to dynamic situations. So if you're a player, um, is the level readable? Do you uh, look at the level that, uh, that you're playing through, look at across it and make a plan for how you're going to proceed? Um, and, and then are you able to play that out versus situations where the level is either unknown to you or changes suddenly and you have to deal with those kind of changes? Um, you know, in, uh, in the case of the, the second case, the designer is intentionally designing the level to force the player to improvise, right? Um, versus designing a level that allows the player to plan and then execute on their plan and try to see what um, how it goes. Um, so those kind of things can be at odds or support each other. So another uh, uh, example of intention and improvisation would be uh, scripted linear or branching stories. So you know, Final Fantasy 13, where you're playing through a story from beginning to end, it's just sort of being fed to you, uh, or something branching like Mass Effect uh, or Assassin's Creed or something where you have an open world, you're going out and interacting in a bunch of different things, but all of the things that you're interacting with and the overall story arc, whatever path you take, is something that was planned by, um, by the designer versus um, procedural or player-generated gameplay, which would be, you know, uh, procedural gameplay would be a, a roguelike or something like that, where um, what the structure of the levels are in relation to each other and what the structure of the level internally is something that's being generated algorithmically and is uh, different uh, every time. And then, um, you know, player generated gameplay would be, um, you know, anytime, um, you know, Minecraft, where you're coming up with what you're planning to do yourself, or any MMO where there's social interaction, uh, economically driven uh, gameplay loops, or uh, PvP uh, structures that form uh, that aren't explicitly designed by, um, by the game designers. How does all that relate to level design? Um, so players, um, 
if you're designing a level and you want players to improvise, then you need to force them to take actions they weren't expecting to have to take. If you want them to be able to plan, then you need to provide them with those vistas or ways to information that they need to plan to survive the game. Um, you know, if you're doing a uh, uh, top-down tactical base building game, uh, if you turn off the fog of war, then you're allowing them to plan more. If you crank up the fog of war so they have very little information, then you're forcing them to improvise as they explore uh, the level. Um, and then uh, the scripted versus linear, um, you know, how do you, how do you build out your level in order to allow players to, um, well, do you build out your level and, and give players a structured experience or um, do you build a bunch of segments that fit well together in a variety of different orders, but uh, always form a coherent experience for the player? Um, and then if you're talking about uh, player generated gameplay, how do you build your levels in order to facilitate and encourage players to be able to have emergent interactions with each other or with the environment? Um, the more tools you give them to interact with the environment, the more emergent gameplay they're going to have, the more you know, set pieces or locations that you provide that suggest social setting, the more likely it is that those players are going to be able to have interesting interactions in those places. Um, cool. So composition and execution. Um, designer composition versus execution of that design. This is one that you should have run into quite a bit already. And that is, you know, you sit down and plan out your level, right? You, you do your, your various diagrams, you think about what it's going to be, maybe you even gray box it. And then, you know, as you're implementing your mechanics or as you're learning the limitations of your skill or of the engine, you have to modify what you're doing. And the level you end up building isn't necessarily the level that you envisioned. And, and generally for the better, right? Like you're learning about the level you're designing as you're making it, comes out different than your plan. And that can be fine um, as long as you're evaluating yourself clearly. Uh, designer composition versus player execution. So when you design the level, um, then you're composing how you think it's going to be played, but the player's execution of your design isn't necessarily going to be uh, the kind of thing, the kind of behavior you're intending. Um, how do you compose your, your level in order to uh, communicate with players, right? Levels as communication, um, having visual cues uh, in journey, being able to see the next interesting thing that you go to that pulls you in that direction. Uh, Hob is the game that I mentioned, I think last week where my partner didn't recognize the visual language of the cracks on the walls. So it was trying to communicate to me to compose my experience, but it failed to. Um, another way you might do that is uh, gameplay cuts, forcing the player to jump from one type of gameplay or one place in the gameplay to another. You see that uh, not very commonly in games, but the game Virginia, does it. If you haven't played Virginia, um, go do that. Uh, it's on the PlayStation Store, probably also on Steam. It's not very expensive. I can't say that it's a fun game, but it's very innovative in terms of how it forces you to play it. You may um, you know, get up from your desk and walk um, to the door to go down to the end of the hallway to talk to your boss, um, FBI uh, setting. And like as you open the door, uh, and see the hallway, the game cuts and you're walking into your boss's office because they weren't interested in the gameplay that would have happened in the hallway. They're just interested in, you know, you choosing to do the thing and you being at the place where it's done. So they do a lot of, of jump cuts, the kind of way you would see in movies, um, but that you don't see in games a lot. Um, and so they're taking control away from you in order to give you more of the experience they want. Um, and they do that a lot and in a bunch of very extreme ways. So the game may not be maybe uncomfortable to you as an experienced gamer because you're not having the kind of experience you're expecting. You're having the kind of experience the designer wants you to have. Um, different gameplay modes, the kind of thing you see in your automata where you're forcing the player to shift from one style of gameplay to another third person shooter to side scroller to top down bullet hell game. Um, and then again, adding and removing control, the kind of thing you would see in a cutscene versus the way that information is conveyed in uh, something like Half-Life where you can always look around and miss stuff in cutscenes if you aren't paying attention. Um, and again, Virginia does that also a lot. 
So uh, composition versus how the player executes on your composition and what you can do about it. And then lastly here, intended behaviors, trained behaviors, and chaotic behaviors. So what do you intend the player to do going into a given encounter level situation in a game um, is, is, your is their intended behavior, what you want um, as a designer. What was the player already trained to do? Uh, a lot of people have played a lot of games or are coming to games from having lived in you know, the real world. And uh, there are certain ways they, they expect to behave. Um, so you might see somebody who has played you know, a lot of Zelda games come into the inn in your fantasy RPG where you intend for them to talk to the NPC and learn a piece of information. They come into the inn, see that there are some plots around and run around breaking the plots, ignoring what's going on uh, in your dialogue because their trained behavior is, I should break plots to see if there's stuff in them for me. I should break crates, right? Um, so that's a trained behavior. You might also see this happening um, when the trained behavior is not relating to games, but relating to the real world, especially if you have newer players, they're going to come into the situation you're presenting and their trained behavior is to treat this like the real world and try to interact with it in the way they would in that situation. And so um, if your target audience isn't hardcore gamers of the type of game that you're um, producing, you might want to consider how would people try to react in this situation and does my game support those behaviors um and then lastly chaotic behaviors that's uh what will the player do in your game that you didn't intend them to do um you know players love to look at the goal that you've set that is like perfectly clear here's the path go down the path go to the town and they're like hmm i wonder what's in that cave behind me that i clearly just came out of in the narrative i'm gonna go try to go back into the cave I'm going to wander off into the forest and see what's there. Um, the example that I love to give um, is a uh, good friend of mine uh, who's been a, a game designer for a bunch of uh, big companies for years, but I, I went to uh, college with him. And in my undergraduate thesis, I had built uh, in VRML, like by hand specifying each coordinate point of each um, axis of every polygon in the game world. Um, incredibly laboriously constructed this whole this whole um, game world where uh, there was a maze and you started out at the um, beginning of the maze and you could explore it. There was a temple at the center of the maze with a sword in it that was glowing and spinning and you could go get the sword. Um, and then the, the maze was surrounded by a, like a small plain and then had steep mountains all the way around it um, to, you know, to, to let you know that you couldn't get out of this area. And then, um, you know, actually everything was on sort of a, um, a floating uh, platform, right? Because uh, I had created it in the void, um, hidden that with the mountains. And I had created a sun that rose and set and it changed size as it rose and set realistically and changed color. Um, all the lighting in the game world changed. It was great, it's beautiful. Um, so I put him into the game. You started, you spawned in front of the entrance to the maze so that you could go and explore the maze. Um, he looked at the maze, saw the temple over the edge of the, the wall of the maze, uh, the light of the sword sparkling inside of the temple temptingly, and turned around, looked at the mountains, and went and tried to climb the mountains. Now, I thought that I had made the mountains such that you couldn't climb them. Turns out I was wrong. Um, he found a way to climb the mountains, uh, took him some good amount of time, uh, got up to the top, slid down the other side, walked over to the edge of uh, the, the floating platform that all of this had been built on, um, watched the sun going around, waited till the sun was right below uh, the edge of the, of the uh, floating disc, hopped off of it and rode the sun around my game world. So that was awesome. That was super not what he was supposed to do in, in the game. Uh, he eventually jumped off of the sun, landed in the center of the temple and was like, ha, huh, I win. And I'm like, you, you really do. And uh, I've learned a valuable design lesson. Players will do chaotic things. Um, and you have to try to anticipate that to the degree you can, uh, if you want to guide their experience or try to lean into that and form, you know, fun gameplay around the, you know, essentially Steiner points that they create, uh, call back to our first class. Um, 
throughout through your game and uh, and make that make them feel like that they've found a secret as opposed to they've broken your game. Um, so you know any situation where um, you know, say goat simulator right is a great example of they're like the players are going to do crazy things. Let's lean into that and facilitate all the weird stuff they might do. Um, you know by structuring our game that way. All right, so that is the most of the lecture. I want to run through the rest of the uh, stuff we're going to talk about in class real quick. Um, so you'll do your show and tell of your emotional patterns. Um, and then we're going to cover the reading. Uh, this uh, slide will be fleshed out and have uh, some more detail from this lecture on it. Um, you will do exercise 14, which is trying to find alternatives to the three act structure uh, in games that you have played, ones that behave differently. So you can think about that uh, leading up to the class. And then exercise 15 is going to be using design patterns to understand techniques. So rather than focusing on the problem that the design pattern is going to solve, you're using it to explore um, and come to understand the technique you're looking at specifically. And a little bit different structure of a pattern. I'll talk more about it in class. This week, you will be trading patterns again with other groups. Um, and uh, I think we have it set the opposite way as last time. So that will um, will mean you're working on the other group's pattern. Uh, so hopefully they will have explored a technique, produced a pattern that helps you understand that technique, and you're going to use that understanding in your level design. The two challenges that I talked about, there is a challenge about using patterns to understand tropes. So if there's a trope you see a lot in games and you want to try to understand what purpose that trope is serving, and maybe if there are ways that you can um, get that effect without bringing the baggage along with you, this can be a good exercise for uh, doing that. Uh, again, if you need to, uh, if you feel like you need to make up some work um, or just have a trope you're interested in, you can do this challenge. The other challenge you can do this week is uh, patterns from basic mechanics. So I'll talk a little bit about this one because um, this concept is sort of interesting. What is the basic uh, mechanic of a game? Um, what is the, the core mechanic, the core gameplay loop? Um, you know, in a way that is not just describing, you know, jumping is the core gameplay loop, right? Like, okay, sure, but of Mario Brothers, but um, trying to, to get a, a little bit deeper understanding of what that gameplay loop is doing. So um, the, the way you go about this exercise is uh, think of a game that, that you, you know, has a strong gameplay experience, um, and then think of the way that you might uh, describe that game if you weren't a game designer and you were describing it excitedly to a friend who you wanted to get to play it. So, you know, Overwatch is like this game that has really awesome characters. They're like, they do all these really cool different things to each other. Um, and, you know, they, they all play together and it's, it's really interesting. Okay, cool. Um, what that's really talking about is the fact that those players have asymmetrical roles within uh, the game. And that, what does that get you? What does that kind of asymmetrical uh, uh, gameplay style get, um, especially when you're introducing new characters or uh, you know people are, are learning to master new characters? Well, you get a complex metagame where the ways that the players interact with each other change as everybody learns to exploit those characters rather than having uh, just a single flat set of characters that everybody's getting better at the the way characters are used and interact with each other produces complex metagame so there's a number of other examples um, that talk about that this is uh, one of the advanced exercises it's hard um, but uh, if there's a game that you want to really get to the heart of and understand how it works um, then take a whack at this exercise and see what you come up with um, i'm curious to see if anybody takes up that challenge and then to conclude really quickly um, your assignments this week, again, you know, write, doing your uh, one paragraph writing about each of the writing assignments, finishing up exercise 14, um, finishing exercise 15 and entering it into the pattern library. Your design project is again going to be designing a space using your uh, exercise, the pattern you're given from exercise 15, um, and then trying to implement that space in the editor, trying to bring it to a higher level of polish this time um avoid using too many assets from the asset store, store uh especially for things that are core to the pattern you're trying to implement you want to implement as much of that uh, on your own or from scratch as possible using stuff from the store to sort of help flesh out and decorate and fill in 
uh, your, your levels make them feel more like a complete space. Um, if you are using a lot of assets, again, consider gray boxing uh, in the beginning to get a sense of scale and rough out your level before just um, pulling in assets to, to complete it. Um, obviously document this new reading assignments document, make sure your pattern is entered into the library. Um, and then if you do one of the two challenges, those are listed in the readings and assignments documents, so you should be able to um, record those there as well as in the library. All right, look forward to seeing you in class this week.